Um, this year we are studying the fruit of the Spirit, and we're going to be studying 12 fruit of the Spirit. Every month we're going to be looking at a different fruit. Some of people, some people may say, I, only, I thought there were only 9 fruits. Well, there are 12, so we'll show you that throughout the year. Okay, uh, but there are 12 fruit of the Spirit every month. We're going to consider one, and this month we're considering, the, we're considering love as the first fruit of the Spirit. So let's read, let's read Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. Let's read out loud. It said, hear all Israel, let's read out loud. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then the next verse says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength. With all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. If you look at the three texts here, it talks about loving God with three aspects of us. Of us the heart, the soul and the strength somebody say heart soul strength heart soul strength the bible says if we're gonna if we're gonna love god we need to love god with those three aspects of our being a heart our soul and our strength i'm gonna begin with the last one first the reason that i'm gonna begin with the last one is because i'm gonna move from somewhat the least important one to the most important one the first way that we love God is loving God with our strength. Um, when we talk about loving God with our strength, it basically means loving God with our physical body because strength is found in our physical body. We love God, the very first level of love is when we love God with our physical body. Now, somebody might say, well, I never thought you could love God with your physical body. Yes, you can love God with your physical body. In fact, when you get saved, the very first place where your love for God manifests is in your physical body. So what does it mean to love God with your physical body? Fundamentally, to love God with your physical body means enjoying the presence of God and enjoying serving God. You see, when I was born in a Christian family, but I wasn't always saved. Just because you're born in a Christian family doesn't make you saved. You, you understand that? Okay, so, um, you know, you could have a donkey in a garage. You could have a donkey in a garage, but that will not make it a Mercedes. You understand what I'm saying? usually cars usually have cars in a garage but you could have a donkey in a garage too but that won't make the donkey in a car what i'm saying is that your environment doesn't make you who you are you understand what i'm saying your environment doesn't make you who you are just because you were born in a christian family doesn't mean you're a christian just because you're coming to church every sunday doesn't mean you're a christian the environment doesn't make you a christian what makes you a Christian uh, is your personal decision. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, in order to be a Christian, there's got to be a day that you had confessed with your mouth. And you say, Lord, I realize that I am a sinner. I realize that I have broken your laws. I realize that I need you. So, Father, please forgive me of my sin. Write my name in the book of life and use me for your glory. One, when you confess God personally with your mouth as your Lord and as your Savior, that's when you get saved. Does that make sense? So, coming to church doesn't necessarily make your person saved. So the reason that I say that is because I was born in a Christian family, but I was, on, I was not always saved. I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ in my life as my own Lord and my Savior at 14 years old. Uh, but I, I remember even though I wasn't saved, but you know, uh, you know, especially Haitian parents, you know, Haitian parents, when they say you're going to church, you're going to church. Okay, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're saved or not, whether you want to go to church or not, whether you enjoy it or not. Today we're going to church and everybody's going to church. You understand what I'm saying? All right, so basically I was raised with my, my parents, Haitian parents, everybody goes to church on Sunday, whether you like it or not. So I had been going to church, but you know, but I wasn't saved. And because I wasn't saved, it was difficult for me to enjoy the presence of God. 
So I remember when we first started going to church, we would be going to church. Man, my goodness. Every time we would go to church, I'd have a headache. Every time, you know, I hear church, it's time to get up, the, get up and go to church. You know, I want to stay in bed and I want to watch TV. I want to do other things. But my parents said, you have to go to church. I would go to church, then everything would be annoying to me. They would sing us, you know, the, a, a song. You know, it could be a great song, just like we sing right now. They would sing the chorus, uh, you know, one time, two times, three times. After like three times, I get, I mean, I get annoyed. I'm like, how many times are you going to sing the same song? I mean, how many times are you going to keep on singing the same thing? I'm just tired of hearing the same chorus in my mind. Like some, the, the message appeared too long for me. You know, uh, you know, if the preacher was preaching 45 minutes, he was preaching, uh, I don't know, 30 minutes, he was preaching an hour. Now, mind you, I didn't mind being in front of the TV. You know, my movie would be like 90 minutes, two hours, and we would watch them back to back. You know, we would, you know, we would begin, you know, watching TV. Like, you know, some days we would just spend the entire day in front of our television set. But that never bothered me. But as soon as I went to church, I felt the singing was too long and the message was too long and, uh, and the announcement was too long and the pastor talked too much, etc., etc. Why? Because I wasn't saved yet. As a result, my body did not enjoy God's presence. Does that make sense? Yeah. My body didn't enjoy God's presence. But one day, on a Friday night service, there was a young girl in our youth group. And I'll never forget that. A young girl by the name of Michelle. She was leading the service. And she was singing a song. Jesus will come morning or night or day. And the question was, would, will you be ready? And I don't know, because I didn't enjoy church. So, uh, you know, when I sat, my friends, it used to be myself and two other friends. We used to sit all the way in the back, and we would come to church, you know, we, we figured since we weren't enjoying the service, we might as well have fun. So we usually, you know, we would, we would sit right behind the girls, pulling their hair, and, you know, we'll do all kinds of crazy things in church. But some way, somehow... In the midst of the talking and the, and, and the fun and everything that we were doing, she started singing that song. When she started singing that song and the question was, will you be ready? Suddenly, suddenly, suddenly that sentence, that song caught my attention. And I heard a, a, a question. It is as if I heard somebody's voice in my spirit. It says, the song says, Jesus will come. A morning uh, will come in the morning at noon or at night. Will you be ready? And, and when the question rang in my spirit, I knew I wasn't ready. And suddenly, my body's temperature started to go up. You know, uh, I felt that my heart was be beating faster. I felt hotter. I felt like this, all of the hair, the, the hair on my head was standing straight up. I didn't know. I felt like electricity going through my body. And I came under a deep conviction. And before she was done singing the song, I came forward. I came forward with tears in my eyes. I gave my life to Jesus. There was no altar call. The day that I gave my life to Jesus, there wasn't a preacher who called me to, came, to come forward. I was in the back having fun with my friends, bothering the girls, etc., etc. And then suddenly that question was asked in my spirit and I got convicted. And I came forward by myself without anybody asking me to come forward. And I came and I gave my life to Jesus. I didn't quite understand what pulled me forward, but I felt something mighty had happened. But you see, I gave my life to Jesus that Sunday. But the next Sunday, something, I was different in church. Um, before... You know, my parents, our parents had to argue with us and wake us up out of bed for us to get dressed and get a shower. But the next Sunday, I was the very first one who got up. I got up early. I had my Bible. I got my hymn book under my arm. And I was ready. Before my parents were ready to go to church, I was ready to go to church. And I started enjoying the presence of God. I started worshiping. Are you guys? I started saying amen in the message. Now, I used to think that service was too 
too short. Now I begin, I, I used to think that service was too long. Now I began thinking that service was too short. When the service was over, instead of me running before the benediction to go home so I can do something else, now I start hanging out. It's like the presence of God is there, everybody's going home, but I feel there is something in the atmosphere. I want to linger a little bit more. I start talking to my friends. So at night, I'm, after the service is over, we, so the service would be over, I would be meeting with my friends, we would be talking about the service, we'd be talking about the message, we'd be talking about what we'd be doing for the Lord. So now when they are getting ready to close the church, they used to tell us to get out of the church because we used to be the last one leaving. Even when they tell us to get out, we will get into the car and continue to talk about God and continue to enjoy the presence of God. What happened? Because Christ came into our lives and the very first thing that he produced was a love for his presence. I declare in 2020, you're going to enjoy the presence of God. I declare no more struggle for you in prayer. I declare no more struggle for you when you're reading the Bible. I declare no more struggle for you when you're in God's presence. You're going to enjoy God's presence. You're going to be, um, you're going to enjoy reading scripture. You're going to enjoy fasting. You're going to enjoy being in his presence. You're going to be like David. I would rather spend one year, one day in the presence of the Lord than spending a thousand days elsewhere. You're going to be like David. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord somebody shout glory the first level of love that you get if the first level when you love God the very first place it manifests is in your physical body you start to have an attraction for the presence of God the presence of God didn't mean anything to you before but suddenly now there is that attraction for his presence to talk to him so you will find yourself instinctively uh, praying. You didn't mean to pray, but you would find yourself driving and suddenly you're, you're praying and suddenly you're singing because the very first place it's going to manifest. Loving God with our body means enjoying the presence of God, enjoying serving God. When I come to church, I come, I worship, I serve the Lord. It's a manifestation of my love for him. But even though this is love, you don't want to stay at that level. Because even though loving God with our strength or loving God with our body is good, but it is not good enough to take us to where God wants to take us. Because loving God with your body makes you a faithful, makes you a faithful Christian. But it doesn't give you, it does not give you a transformed life. There are people who come to church every Sunday and their life is never transformed does that make sense so if you're gonna love God if you're going to have a transformed life if you're really gonna look like God you got to move to the second level because he said not only love God with your strength but he says love God with your soul now the soul has three important aspects it has it has mind it has emotion and it has will but the, the chief, the most important aspect of the soul is the mind. Because what you think will affect how you feel. And how you feel will affect how you act. If I walk into this place and I think people love me, I'm going to feel love. I'm going to feel appreciated. I'm going to feel a certain way. And based on what I feel, I'm going to act. If I feel love, I'm going to talk to people. I'm going to embrace people. I'm going to hug people. I'm going to be uh, relaxed when I talk to them. But if I, do, if I walk into this place, I don't think people love me. I will feel rejected. I will feel unaccepted. Therefore, it will affect the way that I act. I will be close to myself. I will not want to talk to anybody. I will try to come as late as I can and leave as early as I can because I don't want to be connected with anyone because I don't feel that's my place. What we think affects what, what we feel, how we feel, and how we feel affects what we, uh, the way that we act. This is why the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if we are going to have a transformed soul, 
the very first part that has to be transformed is the mind. That's why the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter, two, chapter 12, it says be transformed by the renewing of the mind. If your mind is transformed, your feelings are going to be transformed, your attitude is going to be transformed, your behavior is going to be transformed, your actions are going to be transformed, is that mind is transformed. Does that make sense? So loving God with our body, first of all, we love God with our body or our soul, and secondly, we love God with our soul. We love God with our strength, and then we love God with our soul. Loving God with the strength, with the soul, means loving God with our mind. What does that mean? It means to align our minds with the mind of God. Paul says, have the mind of Christ. He says, have the mind of Christ. What does that mean? You have your human mind and you have the mind of Christ. You have your personal mind and you have the mind of God. Having the mind of Christ or having the mind of God, what does that mean? It means exposing myself to the word of God. Learn how God thinks and think the way God thinks. When I learn to think the same way that God thinks, when I learn to have the same perspective that God has, when I learn to appreciate life the way that God appreciates life, I start to think like God's think. Now I love God with my mind and I love God with my soul. Does that make sense? If you understand, shout glory. So, you can have, listen, there are Christians who love God with their body with their bodies, but who don't necessarily love God with their minds. In other words, those Christians are Christians who come to church and say, you know, they, they're in church every Sunday. I mean, you'll never walk into Tabernacle of Glory and not see them in church. They, they there, you know, every Sunday, they, they, they are church, and sometimes they take multiple services, two, three, or whatever service that we have. They are in every activity. Okay, when we have 40 days, they are there. We have 12 nights, they are there. Seven nights, they are there. You know, uh, uh, you know they enjoy. When, when the worship starts, they begin crying. The presence of God touches them. You could tell that they're into the worship. But when they leave the place, when they leave the church and they get to, the, to their workplace and you hear them speaking, you hear them reasoning, you hear them say, you know, certain things, the way they reason about life, then you realize the way they think is not any different than the way an unbeliever thinks. So that person loves God with his body, but not with the mind. In other words, they have a pagan mind in a Christian body. A Christian body, but a pagan mind. So outside, it's Christian. The way they dress, the way they show up to church, the way they worship, everything that the body has to do is Christian, but they're reasoning. They're reasoning. They're reasoning. And I see that all the time. You know, as a pastor... That's one of the things that saddens me. It saddens me all the time. Do you know how many times I meet uh, with Christians or I hear Christians, you know, couple talking to one another and say, listen, if you don't shape up, I'll divorce you. But when I hear a Christian saying that, all it's telling me is that the mind has not been transformed yet. Because if... The God that you serve says, I hate divorce. God says, I hate divorce. How can you get into an argument and the very first thing that you're going to say, if you don't shape up, I'll walk out of this house or one of us is going to leave. You know, something, that's exactly the way an unbeliever processes it. But we Christian, we take our word seriously. When we get married and then the pastor says, do you agree to take so-and-so in sickness or in health? In good days or bad days? Isn't it what it says? In wealth, in riches, or in poverty, for rich or for poor, for better or for worse? Isn't that what it says? And we make that vow and we understand that God is the witness of that vow and we make that covenant with that person in front of God, then we take our word seriously. Does that make sense? So, 
it's very interesting to see how many, how many times Christians, we would, in our body, we worship God, Lord, we love you, we, are, we, we glorify you. But when we have to reason, we reason exactly like pagans do. Why are you leaving this marriage? This guy is not affectionate. Since when? Tell me one place in the scripture where the Bible says that you, 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 you stay married because somebody's affectionate. Tell me, give me one verse in the Bible that says that. Staying in marriage, being married, is not whether, you know, somebody's affectionate or not, the person brings flower or not, or my wife does this or not, etc., etc. It's the fact that I gave my word before God and I have a covenant and I'm going to respect the covenant that I have made with that person and before God. Does that make sense? Well, if you can't say amen, say ouch. We have a lot of Christians in church. Christian body, pagan mind. Loving God with our souls means letting the word of God transform our mind. I refuse to think like the, the world thinks. I refuse to think like a pagan thinks. I refuse to think you know, like somebody who doesn't know Jesus. To love God with my, my mind means, Lord, I'm going to take that mind and I'm going to offer my mind to you as a sacrifice. And as of today, the way that you think is the way that I'm going to think. And the only way that happens is when you expose yourself to the Word of God, love the Word of God, read the Word of God, and apply the Word of God in your life, no matter what it costs you. Somebody shout glory. Oh, Lord. Father, transform us. Transform us. Transform us. Transform us. Transform our mind. Transform our mind. Transform our mind. Transform our mind. Shekinah app. Téléchargez-le. Kounya.